Coming up on this week's show, the most expensive retro game ever sells at auction. Turn your snares into a MIDI synthesizer. And we celebrate the amazing Jeff Minter with our guest Paul Doherty. The Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each week with our wonderful friends at Bitmap Books. Now, they've actually just released their brilliant new, most ambitious project ever, a guide to Japanese role-playing games coming in at a massive 652 pages and covering the entire history of JRPG games. You can find out all about that and pre-order right now for the next run of the book on their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 284, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood, me, Ravi Abbott, and me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's show, where each week on this podcast, we take you behind the scenes into the world of retro gaming with a wonderful guest on each episode. And before that, a little roundtable chat with our resident gaggle of geeks, our Network of nerds are delectable dweebs. <laughs> Have you got these written down by any chance, Dan? <laughs> or, or memorized. <laughs> that, that doesn't describe you guys at all, actually, because we put, um, we put a picture, actually, of us three on our Facebook page at Joe's birthday party a couple of weeks ago. And the comments on there was like, Joe looks nothing like he sounds. He actually looks really cool. Yeah, not about <laughs> us. So. Yeah, I, don't, about I, don't, right. I don't know if that was a compliment or not. Like, you know, he actually looks really cool. I was like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> but, you know, we do live and breathe retro games. And, uh, of course, we're going to be talking about all the big stories that have been making the headlines over the last week. One that actually has been everywhere. I saw it this morning on uh, BBC News. It's been all over the place. Um, this first ever million-selling retro game sold for a million dollars. So we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Before we do, actually, um, we've got an amazing guest on this week's show. Now, this week, it's quite an unusual one because it's not very often that we get somebody else to come on the show to talk about someone who we've already had as a guest in the past on, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit meter, isn't it? <laughs> but, yeah. um, kind of Jeff Minter is uh, an absolutely amazing amazing developer you know he's an absolute legend with developers as well not just not just gamers they all love him and paul doherty is from new york he's doing a documentary about jeff minter and it's called heart of neon and we're going to talk all about jeff minter the coming up documentary and his kind of development style because you know he's done over a hundred video games and they're all under the banner of llama soft which is uh his company formed back in 1982 and to be honest, not much has changed at Lamasoff. Like, he's never compromised with his style. He's always, you look at a game and you see it and you go, that is a Jeff Minter game. Yeah. And even to the modern systems like VR and um, some of the stuff like Neon, which was the um, kind of electric light engine that he had. Oh, the VLM and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, um, it is interesting because we've had Jeff on the show before. Um, we interviewed him at Play Expo in Blackpool about, two or three years ago, um, and we played that interview out on the podcast. But this, I think, is really interesting because you'll know, I mean, anyone that's met Jeff will know he's actually quite a, a, he's quite a personal guy. He doesn't really talk a lot about kind of what he does outside of just his games. But actually, Paul, he's visited the Llamasoft farm many times. You know, Jeff actually lives on the farm and makes all his software there. And he's kind of formed a close relationship with Jeff. So we find out a lot of stuff that talking to Jeff himself – Stories that you probably wouldn't get to hear. And it's it's not just about the kind of old days and, uh, you know, the old 8-bit systems as well. If you think about it, Jeff was made the head developer for the Atari uh, Jaguar. So he he was involved in the Connex multi-system as well. And uh, our actual guest, Paul, was involved in the Connex. Um, you know, it's it's really mad, the kind of span of his career and, and, and the interest. And also just that complete different development style like talking about the cottage and where he works it's completely different to like something like ea nowadays you know you've got hundreds of people working in there here you've got jeff you know streaming llamas and feeding them biscuits when he takes a break <laughs> and uh, going to going to curry houses but still producing absolutely amazing titles 
So yeah, it's definitely going to be a different look at Jeff Minter that you may have not heard in our first interview that we actually did with Jeff himself. And Paul Doherty is coming up, the guy behind the new documentary that's out soon called Heart of Neon, and he'll be on the podcast in around 20 minutes from now. Now, before we get into that, we need to talk, of course, about the um, Super Mario 64 game that has sold for a ridiculous price this week and has been all over. But let's give a big thank you to... Our latest sponsor, and this is our good friends at Michel Thomas. Now, um, Ravi is going to do the rest of this podcast in French. <laughs> I've, I've been learning it. I, I'm not that good yet, but it's it's been really fantastic learning it. And uh, it's been, c'est très confortable pour moi, which uh, is very, <laughs> nice. very comfortable in French. <laughs> now, ben, Ravi's only been doing this for a couple of days. It's not, you know, not necessarily the best advert of what this can do for you. But this is an audio-only language learning method that works with how your brain naturally learns, retrieves, and retains information. Now, there's actually 17 different languages that you can learn at varying levels. Foundation, which I think it's fair to say you're at foundation level with your French right now, Ravi? Uh, yeah, I am. Like, at school, <laughs> I could never really sit down and concentrate and focus on it. And it was, you know, reading out of textbooks, shouting out and repeating sentences. But the the way that this works is, you know, being audio, you can stream it or, or download it via the app and listen to it, like, if you're just doing gardening or anything like that. And it kind of works seamlessly. You know, you're sitting there and there's free people in the app. So you don't, you know, they're asking questions, they're mispronouncing stuff as well. So you don't feel like you're kind of uh, messing up, you know, you let them do that. And it's just a really nice way of doing it. Um, It's hard to explain, but it removes all the kind of stress from learning. Uh, You can just sit back, relax, and it kind of just gets into your brain and you, and you memorize everything. And like all the hard work is is kind of done. You know, he talks about the relation of languages. So he'll talk about the English language and the relation of French and, uh, you know, really simplifies it for you. And um, it feels like uh, your, your brain's kind of naturally learning and uh, retains and receives this information. And I'd listen to it and I'd go off and then I was like, oh, yeah. And I was actually able to mm. recall it really quickly. Well, I love that about it as well. Cause, I mean, like, like I said, you know, this foundation level, then you'll uh, move into intermediate level to get, you know, solid working knowledge of the language. And then you can improve with the vocabulary courses as well. And then inside of courses to get you sounding more like a native speaker. And I love that, you know, the fact you said then there's more like it feels like you're in a classroom and you kind of become the third student in a tutoring session with the course's teacher. So you're learning alongside two other students who are also new to the language as well. You're not kind of dropped in at the deep end on your own. It's great because you can build up a, a base of the languages. And uh, as I said, there's all these different levels, uh, intermediate language builder vocabulary, but also you can link sentences together really quickly. And and that's what gets really satisfying. You know, straight away, you're able to speak and, and, and do sentences. And, you know, when I was at school, there's there's a phrases that everybody learned, but, but this is completely different. It's a, it's a different method of learning it. And it can fit seamlessly into your schedule. I know you were learning it on the train the other day because it's audio only. You can listen anywhere. Yeah, well, you have to you have to say the words out loud. So yeah. people on the, there weren't many people in the carriage. So. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's really good fun. And uh, Michelle Thomas as well. He he was actually a World War Two veteran, and uh, mm. he was imprisoned in the Nazi concentration camps, and that led him to kind of work with the U.S. Army doing counterintelligence and. Uh, that's developed a deep interest of uh, the vast capabilities of the human mind. So he, he kind of understands an effective way of doing it. And it's a, a total different language learning method. Yeah, so we want you to try this out for yourself. I mean, Ravi's had incredible success already. Um, Joe and I are going to be trying it for um, next month as well. So um, I'm going to try Italian. I don't know what Joe's going to try. He's still, uh, I, I'm going to have a stab at German because I did German for right. five years at school and I can't even say hello. So <laughs> we'll report so our progress next it, month. I was going to say, I'll um, see if I do better with this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we want you to join us on our journey, though, as well. Learn a language for good with the Michel Thomas method. And actually, you can start your language journey right now with an incredible, 25% off. All you got to do is nip onto their website, www.michelthomas.com. That's M I C H E L 
T-H-O-M-A-S.com and just use our discount code RETRO at checkout and you can claim 25% off any Michelle Thomas course. And of course, I'll link that in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, I don't know about you guys, I've been seeing this story absolutely everywhere this week. Super Mario 64 has sold for a record-breaking $1.5 million at auction. Yeah, I didn't get it. Before we get into <laughs> it, could I just say, like, this is a cartridge from 1996. So, like... They made 11 what, million of these. It's not a rare yeah, game. Yeah, what was it? Mega rare? Or what? what's going on, no. Joe? I don't... I, I'll explain. <laughs> so, yeah, Super Mario 64, 11 million copies. It is not a rare game by no means. It's a sought after game because it's, it's, it's Super Mario and the Mario games generally, you know, genuinely hold their uh, their value but essentially the reason this is sold for so much um or it's getting so much hype about it is not because of its rarity at all it's because of the condition of the game so it's been graded by wada games and it's been graded as a 9.8 a plus plus rating which means it is in both near perfect condition and its seal is intact classed as like new so essentially it's in almost perfect sealed condition it's 9.8 out of 10 essentially we call um, this uh new old stock basically yeah, yeah basically, it's 25 yeah. years so, old it's not going to get better than that i guess is it yeah so it, it's it's not the fact that the game's rare or anything it's the condition of the game so essentially somebody's paying 1.5 million dollars for the cardboard and the seal which is crazy to think because if i remember is buying super mario 64 brand new for my uncle for christmas you know in like 96 or 97 and it's crazy to think that I've held one of them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, and it, and it's crazy because this comes shortly after we actually mentioned last week um, that an original Zelda cartridge was on a hundred thousand um, dollars, which actually sold for eight hundred seventy, yeah, eight hundred seventy thousand dollars in the end. You know, there's um, going to be a video game shop that's going to have a crate of these somewhere, like oh in that God. condition as well. Y- yeah, or there's going to be blokes resealing it. You know, you can do that dodgy reseal trick <laughs> yeah yeah there is that well apparently according to wider games um apparently there is about four or five of these flying about floating about so it, or fewer than five copies in this condition exist apparently so i'm assuming they've graded a couple of super mario 64s um now obviously as you said dan you know you've heard it on the radio you've seen it on bbc news um the article i'm reading right now is on bbc news it is everywhere but there's a little bit of conspiracy behind it and a little bit of mystery behind it so apparently another copy of Mario 64 at 9.6 A++ rating sold for $13,200 recently. I don't Which know normally that would, that would be a lot, wouldn't it, normally? That, for that, that game. is still a, a, yeah, <laughs> yeah. a lot of money. Because this game's like 50 quid, 40 quid. You know, mm. I mean, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure Mario 64 box is like 50, 60 quid, something like that. Um, so, you know, like 70, 80 dollars. And yes, we have seen a lot of games going for a lot of money recently. You know, recently a Final Fantasy III in mint condition sealed went for like $96,000. Uh, and, you know, we've all seen the the Super Mario NES go for $660,000, which we covered last year. Um, a Link to the Past sold for $96,000 sealed as well. But $1.5 million does seem awfully high for a very common game. Um, now, I'm not too sure of the ins and outs of the accusations, but I think, Dan, you said you watched a video about it. Yeah, so it is a weird one because, I mean, everyone's obviously it's been, you know, I saw it on GMTV. They were talking about it, you know, check your lofts this weekend, see if you've got one in there. (laughs) Didn't your dad text you, Ravi? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, he said, said, oh, can I get a copy of Super Mario 64 if you've got one? It's like... (laughs) So he didn't ask, oh, have you got one? He said, can I get a copy? Cheeky guy. <laughs> Give me your copy, Ravi. <laughs> well, this is Heritage Auctions. Now, we've mentioned them on the podcast before. Um, and I was actually watching um, Rich from Review Tech USA has done quite an in-depth video, kind of delving into their history, um, some of which you know, the accusations look a little bit shady in many ways. Mm. And there are, I mean, there, there are accusations that I've seen all over. You know, some people have thought, you know, it, it is this kind of auction shilling. You know, this is kind of a common thing on eBay where you'll get kind of fake bidders right. to get the price up really high. And then whether, you know, the, probably the top person is someone who really thinks that the value is what it's kind of been bid up to. Okay. So, 
there's kind of been a lot of accusations around heritage auctions and that happening in the past. There's actually three documented cases that he links up in his video um, to newspaper articles that date back to 2007 um, okay. of people that um, were trying to sell stuff through them that actually took them to court over accusations like that. So that does raise a few questions because obviously we've seen video games going for ridiculous amounts on eBay and places like that, but nothing on this kind of scale before. And I remember when I first saw it the other day, the f- first thing everyone was saying on Twitter was like, well, that must be money laundering or something. You know, Why would anyone pay that much money for, for a copy yeah. of Super for me, Mario 64? It's, 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 the, it's like contemporary art. You know, It's like, I'm going to buy this Banksy and it's going to be worth loads in the future. It's kind of that, that kind of investment rather than, uh, you know, oh, I'm a really big Super Mario 64 fan. Maybe maybe this person is, and they're going to rip open the seal. <laughs> um, <laughs> Finally, a, a, fresh, a fresh copy of my favorite game. <laughs> yeah, fresh. All right, let's wreck it. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's interesting, though, because, I mean, if there was any kind of shady behavior behind these auctions to get it up to that price, well, the kind of knock-on effect it's going to have to the rest of the retro gaming industry is the big question that I've got. You know, is that suddenly going to price drive everything, all these collectible games, up into the millions all of a sudden? Well, it seems to be working well for these grading people because I'm on their website Mm. at the moment and they say, due to the high volume of orders uh, we've been receiving, we are temporarily changing our tiers and all of this. So basically it looks like they're getting absolutely hammered with everybody going, Oh, we want to grade our game and get one point, yep. <laughs> you know, five million. And, and, yeah. and it's interesting that you, you should say that because I watch um, quite a few YouTubers who, you know, do a lot of reselling and stuff like that. I, 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 I don't do it myself, you know, going around, you know, it's mainly in America going around like these garage sales and stuff like that and going to thrift stores. And there's one particular YouTuber who I won't mention because he, he's a really nice guy and he gets a lot of hate because of he is really big on going around finding these sealed games. Um, he goes to like a lot of game stops and stuff and he finds like PS2 games. So not quite as old as N64 and SNES and stuff. And he sends them off, you know, to water games and stuff and he gets them graded and he buys them for like $10. And then apparently, you know, he gets them graded and they come back like perfect condition, mint condition. And he sells them for like $200 and stuff like that. And he says, he, you know, he's quite open with the comments he gets on his videos. And he's like, oh, you know, people are saying I'm driving up the price of these like common games and stuff like that. And it, and it's kind of like, and he's saying I'm not because of I'm selling the sealed ones. If you want to go out there and buy one just to play, you can go buy it for ten dollars or you know ten quid or whatever kind of thing. Go do that. I'm not doing that. I'm buying. I'm looking, driving around all these different states looking for sealed ones to then make a couple of hundred dollars off it. And it's like, I don't know. I, I find it interesting. I find the videos interesting. I don't know whether I, I I agree what people say about him or agree with what he's saying, but I just it is interesting to see where it's going to go. If he can make a profit, then good on him. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) exactly. But what I find kind of what comes to my mind is, you know, when you get these like antique watches and stuff like that, which sell for millions, which are hundreds of years old and stuff like that, you usually find this because there was only a few of them made. Whereas these games like Super Mario 64, there was 11 million of them made. So like I just find it strange that they then sell for so much money, and and it's not and like it Superman it's one. It's not like Superman issue one. You know what I mean? It's yeah. It's like I I got last week the Zelda one. Like you know the Zelda one that we had on, and okay, that's one of the early editions, the and, early prints and stuff. Yeah, yeah but that didn't yeah. go for as much as this, and this no, is from ninety six. To me, it's a knock-on effect as well. It's the fact that, you know, on BBC Breakfast on television, they're talking about, you know, if you've got a Nintendo 64 and you're at it, you can earn you millions. And, you know, this weekend, you're going to see it on Facebook Marketplace, you know, a tatty old, probably cartridge-only version of it, you know, tr- someone trying to sell it for, like, five grand or something. It's, it's yeah. hype train, isn't it? That's yeah, well, it it's yeah. like uh, I was in York a couple of months ago and I was talking to, there's a game shop there, Sawfum Games. Uh, shout out to Sawfum. And uh, he was saying, the guy who works in the shop, whenever this happens, people always bring in, like, Sonic the Hedgehog for the Mega Drive, just, you know, and they want, like, 100 quid for it on trading. You're going to be at a car boot sale and some guy's going to be like, (laughs) one million, mate. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. Can you imagine that? One million for it at car boot. I looked it up on eBay. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) honestly. So, yeah, there there is going to be probably idiots like that, but whether the actual market itself for for the unboxed ones and the 
on sealed ones go up. But I mean, over the last kind of year and a half of COVID anyway, I feel like retro games have gone up loads. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But will there be a crash? That's the question. Yeah. But I, yeah. I do think, like I said last time, these are the antiques of the future. And mm. uh, yeah, that's, that's, but I just don't see it. 90, 96, come on, that's not retro. <laughs> <laughs> I do think there's a big opportunity at car boot sales for a few uh, unscrupulous sellers this weekend, though, with um, hunting down copies of uh, Mario 64. So uh, that'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, I'm looking on eBay and there's some for like 22,000 <laughs> stuff at the moment. What, already? Yeah, yeah, oh, water graded <laughs> ones, yeah. Oh, my days. <laughs> so uh, we'll keep an eye on that development. Very interesting stuff. Now, last week, um, we are talking about the uh, the Dr. Mario clone that came out on the Amstrad CPC. Another puzzle game has made its way to a British 8-bit micro, and this is Columns. Are you a fan of Columns? I know last week you were saying, Ravi, you're not a big fan of puzzle games. Um, Did you like that one, Joe? Yeah, I, I, you know, I had the, the Mega Games Collection 1 while it was on for the Sega Mega Drive, and, you know, me and my wife, whenever I pop in one of these Sega Mega Drive, you know, like the Xbox One collections or 360 collections, which I find myself playing every year, we always have a good go on Columns. You know, we always have a good couple of games on it. So, yeah, I like Columns. Um, the Sega Game Gear columns is like the one cart that everybody has, and it's like ten p. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that 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 came out, and I really like the music on columns actually, uh, like on the original version. It's good to see it land on the specy. I'm surprised that it's taken this long, to be honest. Yeah, because I mean, it does seem the kind of game that obviously it is very basic gameplay. Um, and really fits them I in, you know, on these 8 bit platforms really well. Speaking of the music, too, check out the music on the Spectrum port of it. It's quite hypnotic, isn't it? Mm, yeah. <laughs> I'm in a trance. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a brand new one actually that's um, a port of columns to the zx spectrum and um, at the time of recording this uh, a video of it just landed yesterday so i'll link that up in our show notes as well um it looks like a really faithful port and you can actually download it for free for either the um 48k or the 128k spectrum and i mean i don't know if you watch a video joe but actually you know if, if you play the original game it looks it's the same kind of concept. You've got to, you know, obviously match the um, the, the colours. It, it's not the most complex gameplay ever. And it's called, I think pillars. Actually, it's called pillars, isn't it? Yeah, pillars on here. Yeah, just yeah. to just to you know keep the it, copyright lawyers. It, it, it does look pretty good. I mean, it's not got obviously all the background jazz and everything like on the Mega Drive version. It is the Spectrum. It is the <laughs> Spectrum, but it looks pretty good for the Spectrum. You know, and and to be honest, like I think we covered it. Um, yeah, the Doctor Mario one last week, and you know they're, they're looking pretty good like some of these Spectrum and like C64 games. So yeah, if you want to give that a download, I'll link it up in our show notes. Now, what about this? Um, something slightly more ambitious. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas has had an 8K remaster. This doesn't look as mind-blowing as I thought it would look. To um, tell you the truth, it's probably the monitor you're watching it on, Jeff. Yeah, it could be just that I'm on, you know, a cheap monitor that Dan picked up for me off eBay. It's not year. an 8K one. <laughs> it's not an 8K one. Definitely not. It's definitely not an 8K one. I mean, it looks nice because there's no, like, draw distance and stuff like that. But it is kind of like that question, how sharp can you make a PS2 game look? Like, what <laughs> they've done is basically they've blasted up the resolution. Yeah. So, you know, you have your 1080p, which is what you're probably watching it in. Yeah. Um, it, it's gone up to 8K, and they've, they've done this by adding filtering in, and they've upscaled it actually using AI, and that's right. cleaned up stuff. Now, yeah. this GTA modding scene has been around for a lot of years. Like, yeah. you, you could probably straight away just recreate, well... I say it like it's easy, but recreate the whole of San Andreas inside GTA 5. Yeah. And it would look a bit, a lot better. But this is the fact it's on the original GTA and uh, yeah. on, on San Andreas, and it's kind of running on that engine. Now, this modding scene, I remember using a program called Image Tool, IMG mm. Tool back in the days. And we used to do stuff like update all the road textures to yeah. look like 4k road textures and you'd have like we'd update all the signs so it was actual advertising for companies you can have like skins of different cars and uh, i remember the back to the future mod uh, yeah yeah, yeah. The I that, yeah in there and all of that so this is kind of like that but um it's just pumping that you, resolution to, to you, mad levels you know what it probably is as well like it, it probably is my monitor 
Like, you know, that's massively a part of it. Um, but they've not done a comparison, or at least on the video that I'm watching of this. And sometimes your memory gets distorted at how good the game looked when you used to play on CRT. You go back to it and you're like, oh, hang on. It yeah, yeah. They, they, they've done another comparison on the same channel, but it's like you just see a little bit more detail in the road. It's it's just a, a, a higher resolution, but mm. um, he's not running any texture packs. I can imagine if they put texture packs on this, they put like dynamic lighting modifications on there and all that, they could probably get it to look like the GTA 5 level. I think where it appeals is it, it's like if they were going to do a remake of San Andreas nowadays, uh, mm. then, then you know, maybe they could have it like this. I don't even know. Have they done a remake of San Andreas recently? No, yeah. you can't. You can get it on Xbox One um, and PS4, which will probably have some scaled up graphics. Um, it's not the full HD treatment, though, as it yeah, which I know everyone's been HD crying out No, no, it's just the port of it. But yeah, interesting. Like you said, he's not he's not updated the textures because apparently he wanted to see what the original textures look like with you know this really upscaled graphics just to see what they were kind of capable of. But yeah, it makes the game twenty six gigabytes by putting this mod <laughs> wow. on it. Um, now I don't know how big the game was originally, but I can't imagine it was even. I gigabytes. think it was about three. I think. Oh, yeah, was originally. it? Oh, okay, yeah. fair enough. <laughs> about three three gigabytes. Three gigabytes. So just you know put an e8k on it you know what's that almost 10 times as big which is crazy and it's interesting because apparently you know i mean i'm not too clued up clued up with the uh the newer consoles but apparently the ps5 can't even run 8k resolution you know it's funny i've got a 4k tv and even finding 4k content you know apart from using like um ultra hd blu-rays and you know the odd thing that you get on netflix there's not a lot of 4k content out there anyway and, uh, netflix, an TV. netflix isn't really 4k as well because they've got to compress it and fire it down the line so yeah but imagine this like you've got your, your fancy new 65 inch 8k telly and you're like well i need something to watch on that and the only thing you've got is a, a playstation 2 game let's bring up scale to 8K. <laughs> all these old, old, old <laughs> or, or playing textures. or playing yeah. columns on a spectrum on it <laughs> <laughs> that would look sharp in 8K. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I do think it is awesome when, you know, fans love games that much that they want to actually um, work on them and put that amount of effort into them. That's really cool. And come on, we, we need a proper HD remaster of San Andreas. I think we just um, need GTA Vice, 6 at this point. Yeah. <laughs> well, Vice City as well. I mean, yeah. Vice City, everyone's been crying out for that for years. I, I've just got a PSP better. and I'm just about to play Liberty City Stories and Vice City Stories because those are ones mm. that I missed out. And... Uh, Chinatown Wars as well. So yeah, man. Yeah, they're fun. good ones. Well, um, what about this story then? Something uh, that I know will appeal to you guys. You know, I've, I've got a musical bone in my body, but I know you, you're in a band, obviously, Joe, and Joe, um, Ravi, you do a lot of DJing on your Amigas and stuff. Have you ever fancied incorporating a SNES into your musical setups? I love this. So this is the <laughs> Super MIDI pack uh, that turns your Super Nintendo console into a playable MIDI synth. And this do you want to is... hear a bit of it? Yeah, go for it. Nice. <laughs> it's got a bit of a, an LGR kind of vibe, that, isn't it? <laughs> so this is actually coming out of the Super Nintendo. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. Th so this isn't emulated, is it? At all? No, this is using the, the Super Nintendo sound chip. Uh, yeah. the, the main thing that's actually... So it's a MIDI controller, so you can have like keyboards attached to it. You could have... A, a kind of MIDI input device, but and it's, you can it's, also it, output It's an actual from cartridge, it. isn't it? The cartridge goes into the Super Nintendo, and then that's got, like, the controller ports in the top of it for, like, the keyboards and stuff, hasn't it? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's interesting because he's using this, like, little micro USB adapters um, yeah. uh, that go to MIDI. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a cool little way of doing it because, actually, you could use it as an instrument. So if you had, like... Uh, a, a tracker or a sequencer or a pr separate program and then you mm -hmm. had the snares and you connected that up and then you had like loads of other stuff going on in the band and then you know you just get the snares in there or you you know joe you could have a electric guitar yeah man. hook it up and then play <laughs> it via your snares yeah <laughs> and, and, and using the sound chip you know yeah and what, what i like about it is it's compatible with pal and ntsc which is pretty cool and you get access to all 16 polyphonic channels yeah, because yeah, the means. SNES. Well, well, basically the SNES, like the SNES had more more channels. Yeah. Like you yeah. know, with something like the Mega Drive, you you had a, uh, I think it was four or eight, and um, mm. the SNES was was sixteen. So you always got that kind of more 
bigger, wider sound yeah. with the snares. Yeah, and, and and to be honest, we've seen a lot of this emulated in the past. You know, there's there's actually you know a lot of chip tune bands, and there's like metal bands that have you know used chip tune audio and stuff like that in their music. And but it's always emulation it's always synthesizer emulating the snares and stuff like that whereas this what's interesting about this is like you say it's actually coming through the snares you know using a cartridge which is it's, it's to the really smart using this cartridge and kind of yeah. just developing this software for it it's uh this guy's pretty amazing he's done it you know um he's he's saying as well he's got like sustain which is uh mm. kind of holding down a note yeah and, and this- uh all these different stuff like pitch bend and uh a vibrato and panning you know left to right and uh uh all the all the kind of mad stuff and it's in that uh, snares format s spc and they're going to be coming out on the 15th of october this year for a hundred dollars and i know obviously joe you're in a metal band 100 crowns yes yes share to them uh, <laughs> is that in time to could that make it onto your album i'm just thinking you know <laughs> you, 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 you could do like your death growl over this <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know what? Interestingly, the majority of the band are gamers, but I just, I can't see it personally. <laughs> you Maybe just need we'll... to get, get your drummer and uh, get him an electronic drum kit and hook it up to a snares. That would change things. I mean, you know what? He does have a sample pad because we use a lot of samples in our music. There you go. Uh, so <laughs> it, it isn't out of the realms of reality, put it that way. <laughs> That's all you're missing, Joe. Snez. All we're missing. And, and me on the Amiga then. decks in the back. Yeah, at the side. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we get into our chat this week, um, the heart of Neon inside, the story of Jeff Minter with our guest Paul Doherty. Um, it's time to talk quickly about this. Um, obviously, I, I've got a bit of a passion. I've talked about this on the show before. Weirdly, for getting retro computers on the internet. I'm looking around my room now for absolutely no reason. I've got my Commodore 64 hooked up to the internet. I've got my Amiga 3000 next to me online as well. But actually, modern websites don't work all that well on these, you know, 30, 35-year-old computers. But now someone has changed all that. Yeah, so this is pretty amazing. I love this channel, Action Retro. And uh, what he's done is, you know, any any old system that uses basic HTML, he's he's created a kind of interface. And uh, it means that you're able to strip everything out that uh, causes problems like javascript that modern modern thing and uh, stuff like css you know it's really hard to find kind of old sites that work i i I know a lot of people that use amiga they're like oh this site works on amiga this site works and then a lot of like 10 websites yeah about 10 websites but this guy he's 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 done an amazingly smart thing he's used uh the uh, readability AI from Mozilla, and uh, that actually scans the page. And I think it's for uh, helping people with readability. And what it does is it finds what's actual text in the page, so it won't like find adverts and stuff. And then he's managed to create with PHP an image viewer as well, so you can actually see the images in an old format that your um, your machine's going to be able to view. And he's actually viewing it on a uh, Mac Web 1.1. And the first thing that he's created is FrogFind. So you can go to frogfind.com and that basically strips out anything that you search in the search engine and, and you can view the site. And uh, that's like a portal to the internet to use mm. these old things. And then he's got 68K News as well, which is wonderful because it's a news site uh, with headlines and it's all in basic HTML, which means... You know, he's a Mac guy, but um, he'll probably work on anything with a browser, pretty much. Yeah, even at old Netscape or whatever on Windows. It is good, though, because, I mean, like you said, what he's really doing is he's stripping out all the modern bloat on websites and just reducing them to what a website would have been in, like, 1995, which is great that you can view that on your old machines. But outside of that, I mean, there are actually some advantages of browsing new sites in this way. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to browse local newspapers websites the amount of pop-ups the amount of adverts and stuff that just covers all the articles but using this it gets rid of them all oh i'm I'm looking at the retrohour.com at the moment and uh, a a site that's not bloated no no but also you know you have your links to your mp3s and uh yeah it all it all just works perfectly it's it's really amazing actually 
It is cool. And again, think of it, you know, privacy. I imagine it probably pulls all the, the cookies and the trackers and everything yeah, out as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, there are advantages to doing it that way. And uh, obviously, you know, the speed of loading pages too, outside of, you know, looking at it on your old 486. But yeah, very cool project. So um, I'll link that up. And everything else we talk about, all the stories will be on our website at theretrohour.com. Now, before we get into our chat this week, talking about Heart of Neon, this incredible new documentary all about Jeff Minter, let's just take a moment to give a big thank you to another huge supporter of the Retro Hour podcast, and this is our dear friends at ExpressVPN. Now, obviously, when you go on the internet these days, it kind of feels like, you know, privacy has been eroded more and more, and we're taking more risks every time we go online. Whether you think about it or not, I mean, you know, your, your connection probably won't be interrupted by hackers. Your data probably won't be used against you, but can we be sure about it? But if you're not using the internet without ExpressVPN, it is like driving without car insurance. Why would you take that risk? Now, Ravi, you know, as long as I've known you, you've always been a huge advocate of privacy and protection, and, and you've used ExpressVPN for years now. Oh, I absolutely love it. And, you know, it's so easy to have. You just uh, set it up. I set it up on my PC. So as soon as I start up, it goes on to ExpressVPN. And... You know, now things are kind of opening up a little bit. Uh, People are starting to go to hotels and airports and cafes. And I'd say they're probably the worst place for security Mm. to um, kind of, you know, a hotel that's not updated its internet for a long time and really doesn't care. You know, someone could, uh, with a lot of technical knowledge, um, basically hack you and uh, with a bit of cheap hardware and, uh, you know, all your information and your banking stuff that you're doing, you know, don't log on to your bank when you're on one of those networks without some protection from ExpressVPN. And, you know, it, it, it does act as a online insurance. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel between you and your device and the internet. So hackers can't steal your personal data. And also it's got really, really powerful encryption. So, um, mm. you know, it would take a hacker with an actual an actual supercomputer over a billion years to get past ExpressVPN's encryption. Yeah, and obviously your data is really valuable as well. I mean, you know, hackers can make up to $1,000 per person selling your details on the dark web as well. So you really need to get protected against this. And ExpressVPN, you can set it up on all your devices, on your laptop while you're going out, on your PC at home. All you've got to do is fire up the app, one click, and you're protected. So we want you to secure your online data today by using the VPN that we trust and use, ExpressVPN. And you can get three months free on a one-year plan right now by using our exclusive code, expressvpn.com slash retro head on to that website right now expressvpn.com slash retro and a big thank you to our friends at expressvpn for their support of the retro hour now we have got another patrons hangout coming up again this weekend always look forward to the sundays when we all get together and just completely geek out about i can be anything retro games movies mp3 players mobile phones anything goes on the patrons hangouts i love it but i always end up spending money (laughs) because <laughs> everybody starts showing off everything they've bought over the last month and i'm like i love that i love that i love that and then i, I want it, and they just sit it. there looking at it all it's it's like a, a, a class in it show and tell like yeah it is. Like, it is this. absolutely it's great and like yeah. you say we always end up talking about it's usually pretty retro based but it's films technology like i think last what were we talking about last time was it horror films and sci-fi films talking about robocop and terminator yeah, so it's always loads of fun. And um, actually, last time, you know, every month we get a load of new faces coming to join us as well, which is incredible to see. Um, and we'd love to see you there this weekend as well. Now, Sunday evening, 8 p.m., we're going to be doing it. Um, if you are a patron of this show, you can join us. Every patron is welcome. Uh, we'll put a link on our patron to the uh, the Google Meets Hangout that we do on there. And, you know, if you don't want to join in, you can just sit back and watch. Some people do that as well as we hang out for a couple of hours on Sunday night. And also, for being a patron of this show, you get a lot of other perks as well, including access to our second second patrons only podcast the retro hour after hours that's always fun to record oh it's good yeah we're, we're actually going to be doing an episode this is this is going to be another one where joe shines we're going to be doing an episode on the <laughs> joe <SNES>. always shines <laughs> <laughs> thank you dan <laughs> yeah we're going to be doing our snes memories and favorite snes games um so ravi's had to dust off snes emulator <laughs> yeah, not, I've had to wreck not. my mind. Yeah, I, I knew one rich boy with a snares and I'd go around <laughs> his and play it. 
I've got to download a torrent with um, actually correctly named ROMs for my Super Nintendo as well. I've got at the moment. Uh, I tried to load up Mortal Kombat 3 and um, some weird game with a duck came up last time, didn't it? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'd definitely get that sorted out. But yeah, we're going to be recording Kombat that this week. 3. <laughs> I'd play that. Um, so we're going to be doing a special all about the Super Nintendo that will probably run to about an hour and a half, two hours. Most of our, our After Hours podcasts do. And you get a load more perks for being a patron as well, don't you, Revy? Yeah, so you get the show early, which is really good when we haven't deleted the show. And um, <laughs> it, it means, you know, you, you can listen to it on the move. But also we have an ad-free episode. Now, that's really cool because even at the lower tier, you can get the ad-free episode and... It's as much as like a cup of coffee, really, uh, a latte, let's say. And uh, the ad-free episode is awesome because you can hook it up on the RSS feed on one of your apps. So actually, you can just have that and it will deliver the ad-free one to you straight away. Also, on the higher perks, you can get a T-shirt. And uh, yeah, you can also get the special Discord channel as well, which is the backers chat. Um, When you back us on any level on Patreon, you will instantly get added on Discord if you connect your account up to the backers chat. And can we just say as well, the patrons version without the ads is not a shorter show because we actually do exclusive God, how, how big is it now? Like, I was going to, I was going to say they don't get, yeah, because we find we've been doing an exclusive piece of news for the patrons, but we found that we've actually had to cut some bits recently as well because yeah. <laughs> we are hitting like two hours, but we put the full show out for the patrons, don't we? Yeah, yeah, last week's patron show was about one hour fifty, I think. There so, you go. Um, so, so you get yeah. you get a lot of extra stuff for your money, and you know you're supporting this podcast and helping us stay independent. You know, we're just free lads doing this from our spare rooms. Joe's got a set up with all his computers and games around him and stuff. Same with Dan. <laughs> Dan's got eighty in his room. <laughs> and he's all right, all right. A little, <laughs> a little corner where he's trying to... And a dog. And a dog yep. that keeps barking, yeah. So, uh, uh, and, you know, with your support, we've managed to stay up there in, in the charts with some absolutely huge names as well. So we thank you guys so much. You know, you keep this show going. Absolutely. And we'll give you a big thank you by mentioning you in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame, the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming. Like this week, a huge shout to Pokedex, Joel Foman, Gavin Bunnett, Peter Savage, and Paul Thompson, who all made donations into the running of the show. We massively appreciate that. And if you'd like to do the same, you'll find it on our website at theretrohour.com. Now, just time to quickly give a shout to this week's Retro Gaming Shop of the Week. This is where each week we give a mention to an amazing retro gaming store suggested by one of our listeners, because we like to, you know, keep these businesses going. Um, you know, these places are really important, places that you can actually go to buy physical games, these independent businesses with really passionate people running them. And this time we are going to New York. Yeah, so we've got an uh, email from Rob Schneider, and he says, um, Robot City Games is a, a fantastic place in New York. And uh, he says, I'm not sure if you've mentioned Robot City Games and Arcade, but it's a long-standing used video game store here in central New York that not only has an amazing selection of video games, consoles, and accessories, they have a complete working arcade with 125 classic video games and pinball machines available to play. And, uh, you know, apparently they're spanning from 1974 to today as well. So that's a, a mad selection. This is the first one that we've covered that's got an arcade and a video game store as well can i just say my wife has wanted me to take her to new york for like christmas for years and we never have and now i might be like you know what babe we'll go this year <laughs> you, you've got a reason <laughs> just, now because yeah. <laughs> yeah. this looks incredible like you say they've got like hundreds of arcade machines and pinball machines but as well as that they've got these like absolutely massive cabinets just full of like mega drive genesis games and like snes and nintendo games um this looks absolutely awesome i can you know it, it it's got like a proper like newspaper shop feel to it but it's just like full of retro games and you know they've got absolutely all sorts in there it looks amazing it's, it's like one of those places you want to get trapped in when you're a kid <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, a nighttime home alone style and just go completely mad <laughs> Can I just ask something as well? This was submitted by who? What, what was the name of the person? Rob Schneider. I don't know. If it, <laughs> as in the actor? I don't I know so. because he came up on the Patreon Patreon sh- shout out a couple of weeks ago. I, I, so. ho- I hope he is. If, if not, 
If then not, it's still name, awesome. Wicked <laughs> name, man, yeah. <laughs> he was actually in Home Alone 2, wasn't he? He was a bellman in Home oh, Alone Oh, yeah, he was, wasn't he? So it's, it's, it's all tying and together. Judge this Dredd as season. well. That's good. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> if it is you, Rob, great to have you listening. Uh, but yeah, this looks really good. Robot City in New York. You can check them out at robotcitygames.com and keep your submissions coming in for our Retro Gaming Shop of the Week. Let's give a shout out to the place that you go to get your games, show at theretrohour.com. Quick reminder as well, on our website, our listener survey is running right now as well. We want to know what you think of this show, what you want to hear more of, what you want to hear less of, what systems you're into. And actually, for just filling that in, it'll take you five minutes. You could win £100 to spend on retro gaming goodies of your choice. You'll find that at theretrohour.com. Right then, time to celebrate the legend that is Jeff Minter with our special guest, Paul Doherty from Heart of Neon, next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour, and I'm here with Paul Doherty, and we're going to talk about Jeff Minter, the amazing developer. And Paul's actually directed Heart of Neon, which is a documentary all about Jeff, and we're going to find out about that documentary, but also talk about this just fantastic, outstanding, unique developer that is Jeff Minter. How are you doing, Paul? Doing great, thank you. Oh, excellent. Well, we always start with kind of like, what was the first video game you played? But... uh Seeing this is about Jeff, what was the first Jeff Minter <laughs> game you played? Um, well, that would definitely be Grid Runner on the VIC-20. I mean, uh, I was, I'd was i fallen in love with arcade games as a, as a kid. I mean, I can't, well, it was, what, 82? So all, all I wanted, like a lot of kids, was like to have the arcade experience at home because I didn't have the opportunity or the access to arcades. And Jeff's was the first. I bought a few games for the VIC-20, but Jeff's Grid Runner was the first one that actually felt like an arcade game. So I was, I was a fan straight off the bat. That was, that was a fantastic game. And did you have um, a background in filmmaking then? And were you, were you interested in that when you were young? No. I mean, no. I was, had a background in film watching. Uh, my dad was a huge fan of uh, gangster movies, and he got me into Martin Scorsese. Uh, and then... Yada, yada, yada. 20 years later, I, I considered going to film school because uh, I was no longer in the video games business. And, and the question was like, well, what do I do next? Like, well, maybe I should try films. And I went to film school thinking I was going to be the next Martin Scorsese. And, and I didn't. <laughs> but I got a new career in filmmaking. Uh, I edited TV for a while. And this is my first feature documentary. Um, what kind of stuff were you doing on TV? I saw you were involved in a kind of Pink Floyd uh, a, a, look, a look at the background of Pink Floyd and other stuff, uh, Dune as well? Right, well, um, yes. So I started out uh, working for American filmmaker Ken Burns. Um, his company was like right next to the place where I went to college in, in southern New Hampshire. So I worked on documentaries and moved to New York. And uh, so I, I do mostly, I started out doing uh, long-form documentaries about social issues and historical stuff. And then... Uh, to supplement my income because that wasn't there wasn't a whole lot of work like that. I did animation too, so uh, the gener- I did the animation for um, the making of uh, "Wish You Were Here," the Pink Floyd documentary. I also did animation for Genesis, some of the parts, sort of like a reunion doc about the band Genesis. And uh, in terms of editing, one of the first titles, I, one of the first films I had edited myself uh, was Jodorowsky's Dune, the story about Alejandro Jodorowsky attempting to make Frank Herbert's novel into a, a feature film and and failing dismally so it's one of those films where you already know what the end is before you start watching it so the challenge there was to make it an interesting story and that was a, that was a lot of fun that was a film that i pursued because i saw them they announced that film at Cannes. they were going to they announced they were going to make it at Cannes film festival so i hunted down the producers and badgered them for six months until uh <laughs> they got, until they got me an interview with the director who turns out was looking for an editor anyway I just, want no, to do, uh, I just want to do animation. I just want to get my hands on uh, Mobius's storyboards. They were legendary 3,000 storyboards that Mobius did for, for the film. And I just wanted to see them uh, and uh, maybe do some animation with them. And then uh, the director said, well, how do you feel about editing the film? And I'm like, wah. So, uh, so I worked on that for eight months until they ran out of money, basically. <laughs> well, well, that's great that you've got a background, especially doing stuff like that, because, uh, you know, a lot of video game documentaries come out and a lot of them are quite rough and they're, they're not the best quality, but um, this one just looks fantastic. Well, um, thank you. Uh, why do you think there's not been any, like, Jeff Minter documentaries previously or, or really big looks into Jeff? 
Well, I mean, Jeff's one of those niche figures in games, uh, the games industry. I mean, Jeff was niche in a niche business back in the 80s anyway. I mean, it's not that people don't know who Jeff is who are gamers. It's the people who aren't gamers don't know who Jeff is. So it's, it's harder to get, you know, non-gamer filmmakers, for example, interested in somebody like Jeff. Jeff's a quiet guy. He's not really out to make a big noise. The games that he makes are... A little intimidating, I think, to to non gamers or, or to, to young gamers. I don't know. Jeff's fans are a specific kind of people. I think you'll I think you'd agree with that. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, what, why did he stand out to you in particular? Then, see, I was I was I've been a filmmaker for a while, and I was casting about for uh, a project to make on my own. I'd worked for a few directors, and I figured um, if these idiots can do it, then I should be able to do it. I'm working for the wrong people, so I was considering. Lots of different stories in the video games business. I want to tell something that sort of spoke to the way video game development was like when I was involved and how it's different from now. So try, trying to bridge the past with the present of video gaming. I was considering doing a documentary about id Software and Doom, for example, until somebody pointed out to me that their son thought that Doom looked terrible. He thought the graphics were horrible. Oh, wow. And, All right, that's, that's going to be a challenge. And then I was talking with Gary Lydon, pitching some ideas about, and he said, well, why don't you do a story about Jeff? Jeff's career has spanned the entire history of the video games business, more or less. And I went, that's a great idea, but I live in America and he lives in Wales. So it's probably not a good idea. And then he sort of, we talked about it off and on for another 18 months. And then after a particularly bad job, I went, screw it, Gary, put me in touch with Jeff. Let's make this happen. And that was 2016. April 2016, um, I'd had a, a Skype chat with Jeff and Giles, and he said yes. I'm still trying to finish the film now. But it, it took, took me eight, after Jeff said yes, it took me 18 months to get him to give me a date to be coming to visit him. Um, but it happened. Who's Giles as well? Giles is Jeff's uh, partner in crime. Jeff uh, and Giles are both Lamasoft. Uh, Giles is uh, a, a programmer. Uh, an excellent programmer in his own right. He's more of like a systems guy. I mean, the film, in a large part, goes to explain how Giles's part fits into Jeff's bigger picture. I mean, Jeff partnered with Giles in 2005 for a, a, for a project for the Microsoft Xbox 360 called Neon. I don't know how, how familiar you are with that story. Uh, he had a, had a two-week deadline. Uh, Jeff, being no dummy, knew he wasn't going to be able to do it himself. Uh, so... He'd been friends with Giles on the, the message boards and on the internet for a while, knew that Giles was a, uh, a good systems programmer, and then said, how do you feel about helping me make this happen? The deadline's uh, really tight. Um, what do you think? And Giles jumped in with both feet, and uh, that partnership was so successful that it became a, a business partnership that exists today. Well, we've had Jeff on our podcast before, and I can completely relate to what you were saying then about you know taking 18 months to actually get a date off him. I think it took us about three and a half years, and we had to grab him at an expo because you know, he's such a busy guy. He's got a lot going on, obviously. Oh, yeah. uh, but what was it like when you approached him then, and how did you kind of talk him into it? Was he a bit like, you know, because I know he's a very humble guy. Was he surprised that you wanted to make this movie? Well, I, I, I don't know how to answer that because uh, Jeff doesn't really talk about what he thinks. <laughs> um <laughs> I mean, so to be fair, Gary did. Uh, Gary Lydon is, is, a, is a mutual friend of ours and Jeff's. I, I you know, worked with Gary Lydon for a, lo- uh, a few years in, in London uh, back in the 80s. And he's been really close with Jeff uh, since then. And he basically talked me up to Jeff, put us together, and coordinated the, the Skype call. So by the time I spoke to Jeff, Jeff was sort of already on board. He, him saying yes was no problem. Him getting him to commit to me actually showing up at his farm was, was the problem. And he never said no. He never changed his mind. He just was doing Polybius and was busy. You know, and he and he didn't want to like have his flow interrupted and he's a pretty private guy. Giles is the one who didn't really understand what I was doing. I still don't think he understands what I'm doing. He doesn't understand why somebody would spend so much time and money making a film about him. <laughs> Which is fair enough. <laughs> well what why do you think Jeff stood out from those others in like the Salamander software days. Jeff understands why arcade games back in the day were excellent. He understands, understood then and understands now um, what makes a really satisfying arcade experience. He takes that knowledge, he takes that, and then he combines that with a fundamental understanding of the hardware that he's programming 
in front of him and then just make something I mean, perfect's an exaggeration, but he makes something really excellent out of those two pieces of knowledge. He's a, he's an excellent programmer, and he fundamentally understands what's good about arcade games. So back then, when uh, when the video games started coming out for you know Quicksilver and and you know Imagine, it was largely hobbyists who were making these games. So they were you know talented amateurs. And granted, Jeff was a talented amateur, but he had he just you know he got it in a way that a lot of other people didn't I mean, they were an andrew braybrook got it and you know you know um archer mclean got it but what jeff combined was like getting it and being prolific and, and so that's i mean over his nearly 40 year career he's re- he's released 126 titles at last count he's done most of the conversions for porting from one platform to the other himself very rarely has somebody ported something to a platform that wasn't his i mean, like atari age have done a couple and, and he loves them. But most of the stuff, that he's, it's hundred. there aren't many programmers that I could think of, that anybody I've spoken to could think of, who have made that many individual titles on that many platforms over that long amount of time and is still doing it. You know what I mean? It's, he's, yeah. uh, he has the same intensity now that he had then, just a deeper knowledge and more fantastic hardware. And I think you're right as well about that, you know, obviously back in the 80s in particular, it was that kind of real dream to get the arcade experience at home. And you played games like, you know, Revenge of the Mutant Camels, Attack of the Mutant Camels and Void Runner, stuff like that. And they did feel like the arcade experience, which I think not many programmers could do back then. I was just, I mean, he had a really left field point of view. I mean, Incipital um, sort of blew my mind at the time because it was an arcade game, a single screen arcade game, but with 100 rooms. So it was. It had a map. It was an arcade game with a map. So it wasn't like. I mean, maps were big back in the that period of gaming. Like you know, you get C and VG and have like a double page spread of this huge map of a uh, you know somebody's a cave adventure or whatever. So you're running around, but this wasn't a cave adventure. It was an arcade game with a hundred screens, and it was there's something about that struck me as just genius. It um it wasn't a scrolling game. It was a flip screen game, but you had to get keys. I don't know. I mean, now it seems like, you know, whatever. But back then, there, there wasn't anything like it. It was so unique. And that was just because Jeff looked at the problem. How can I deliver lots of different screens in a way that's compelling? And then he said, well, let's just make it a, a, a maze adventure. Genius. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you first, you know, went to Wales and went to Jeff's farm and got to visit his place, I mean, what's his, um, obviously, you know, having this arcade kind of vibe going through his games, did he have like a big collection of machines there that you saw? Yeah, he has a modest collection, but um, he, he definitely is a emulator user. I mean, it's it's not just like getting your hands on the hardware; it's also maintaining it is an issue. He's got a couple of uh, he's got his Tempest cabinet, and he's got like a, a Mame cabinet where they play a lot of stuff and a bunch of pinball machines. I don't know. He's not. He, that's the thing. He's not a collector. He's a game designer. So he's he's less interested in the hardware part of it, more interested in the game design part of it. So while we were there. I went, when I first went to visit him, Gary Lydon came with us, and, and Gary and Jeff just sat down in front of MAME and played these old Williams games. It was really interesting. I mean, it, it must have been, like, obviously being one of your heroes, it must have been cool meeting him for the first time. To be fair, uh, I don't know how much of a hero he was of mine before the project. I mean, I definitely knew who he was. I definitely liked his games. I played Space... I bought... I'm, all right. I bought a, a, a Windows laptop just so I could play Space Giraffe on Steam. So... I, I guess I was sort of a fan, but I hadn't played a lot of his games at that point. It was it was a little awkward because no, the, the coolest moment was when I had the Skype call. That because I got off the Skype call and I turned to my wife and said, "I just spoke to Jeff Minter," and she sort of shrugged. But I had a great time. That was a, that was a thing. Meeting him at the farm was, I felt awkward because I was making a film by myself and I was walking to this guy's private home with a bunch of cameras and sound equipment, and uh, and he'd never met me. So that so I was super aware of like his boundaries and he never met me so he was he didn't know what to make of me and then we went out for a curry and a couple of beers and it was fine <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a big fan of curries isn't he um which other developers did you have in the documentary then because i know you have some people talking about jeff and, and kind um, of his influence uh well i mean uh gary lyden is in it uh gary penn uh is in it i knew both of those guys from before and i wanted to them i mean the, when i was first getting the project together and nobody knew who i was or what i was doing i wanted to get some people that i knew in it as allies and the two garys really helped out 
uh, through them, I got uh, Jim Cope, who was a, a, f- a fan of Jeff's and uh, got involved in ruffian games with Gary Lynn later through knowing Jeff. Gareth Noyce from Triple E. Uh, 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 Shahid Ahmad is in it. And uh, Peter Connolly, who is an executive at Microsoft, is in it. And then, and then some other people. <laughs> well, when he visited him on the farm, I mean, is it true that he's got llamas there and uh, did he kind of explain his uh, his llama obsession to you oh yeah yeah that's in the film uh he used to have two llamas but one passed sadly uh before i got no. there uh yeah they're llamas are herd animals i mean basically when i'm in the field and they were jeff jeff does that um uh i think he does it on twitch now it used to be a periscope thing he goes out and feeds his uh, his beasties digestive biscuits on a daily basis <laughs> and uh so he took me out to show me that and the llama was just eyeballing me the whole time. So, you know, who are you, and what are you doing here? Yeah, Jeff's just been into llamas since he was uh, since he was a teen. Just he just he just likes them. Now, I'm I'm actually a big fan of the Atari Jaguar. Um, I knew Jeff's games on the eight bit systems, but obviously he was you know hired as a lead developer on the Jaguar. Why did you think Atari saw him as such an asset? Well, I mean, Jeff was involved with uh, Atari UK uh, on the S for a lot of his ST stuff. Well, I mean, I say a lot. He did um, a Photon Storm for Atari UK, and they they well, they'd seen him do Lamatron. Uh, Lamatron, uh, of course, is is inspired by the the Williams Roboton uh, Roboton game, and um, that impressed a lot of people. And they, through his work with Atari UK, uh, he developed a relationship with Atari US, and they brought him in to see the the development hardware for Panther, um, which didn't happen. And it did some stuff on the Falcon too, but it was a Jaguar where the rubber really hit the road um, for him. He was he was also involved in the uh, Conix multi system as well. And uh, what, what kind of work was he going to be doing on that? And uh, do, do you think it would have kind of been a success if it ever got released? Well, I mean, I, that was I almost met Jeff at the Conix uh, conference. I was working for System Three at the time, and uh, me and the couple of guys from System 3 traveled out to Wales where the, the conference was going to be held. Trip Hawkins was bringing a lot of developers in to, to show off what the system could do. Um, I got food poisoning. So I spent the entire weekend um, in the hospital, in the hospital, in the hotel room. Um, I didn't get to meet Jeff because Jeff was uh, basically brought on board really early and he developed a version of, I think it was Revenge of the Mutant Camels on, on the Connex system. The hardware was okay. It, it wasn't super revolutionary, but it was, it was okay. But the fact that they couldn't follow through and deliver it to the market means it, it wasn't going to be successful. It, there was not enough support behind the manufacturing of it. But Jeff, Jeff was on board. Jeff, was, he's in those ads for the Connex chair. So there's a picture of young Jeff Minter uh, in this, <laughs> this basically this, this uh, arcade sit-in um, add-on for the Connex system, which I never sat in. It looked kind of flimsy to me. I don't know. I mean, it's it's one of those could have been's maybe. Um, I mean, Trip Hawkins was fine. He went on to do other stuff, but but the Conics, it just uh, it wasn't the Conics' this time. The Conics is not mentioned in the film, but the Jaguar is. Tempest Two Thousand is Jeff's probably Jeff's most well known, mostly most played game. Mm. To be fair, yeah, and obviously he went on to um, do a sequel to that Tempest Three Thousand on the new one as well. You know, speaking of kind of obscure systems. Right. I mean, I have more people talking about the new one than I did about the Conic. So the new one will probably get a mention. Just, but I had a, a the good. I think it might have been at the, the Blackpool Play Expo. I had the good fortune to play yeah. Tempest Two Thousand. Yeah, it's gorgeous. It's so pretty. But the, the, but the new one is underpowered, so it's it's a it doesn't it's not as smooth as it should be. But I guess like the way it's written, if the the new one device that you're playing it on was more powerful, it would just scale up and be more. But it just never caught on. It's another thing that. Uh, the hardware, the, the, the ambition by, uh, was bigger than the hardware was, which is a shame. Yeah, it seemed like it could have been a project with some longevity, but obviously didn't really get off the, the starting blocks, did it? I think this is the thing that it's, it's actually one of Jeff's strengths. Um, Jeff really, really likes tackling new hardware because his uh, programming skill, like he, he calls it like dancing on the copper. He, it's, it's, his, his, he likes to get to grips with like the, the, the architecture and code well, certainly back in the day, I don't think that's really possible now, but to code at the chip level. So the stuff he was doing on the new one, I don't think anybody else was doing. He was he was d- doing some inc- extraordinary stuff. The, the the resolution of the new one uh, 
was similar to the resolution of, of the VIC-20 in that it was only 160 horizontal pixels. But because he had such fine control per pixel on, on the colors, he was basically anti-aliasing the hell out of it. So it looked like it was higher resolution than it actually was. Um, I might be, I might have like the resolution wrong, but it was certainly a very low resolution for a game system at the time. So he was doing stuff that other people couldn't do. <laughs> so uh, Jeff was ringing the best out of like this hardware that was probably too complicated to work with in the first place. I think that was possibly the issue why some of the systems didn't make it because the, the software wasn't there because there, there's only one Jeff Miner. I, I love that kind of phrase, dancing on the copper. I think that's great. Yeah. And another part of the games, you know, which always gets you dancing is the music behind the Jeff Minter games. Right. Um, the, the music combined with the kind of visuals just puts you into a, a different place. And uh, uh, how important was the music? Well, I mean, not, not every Jeff game has music, but the Jeff games that do have music are, are generally excellent. Um I mean, they're all excellent. They're, they're generally excellent examples of combining audio with video. I mean, it it's, um, isn't necessarily a musician himself. He's played instruments before in the past, but he doesn't call himself a musician. But he has an, an excellent ear, and he has and he um, designs his games with like a tempo in mind. I mean, when you're designing a, um, a level in, a, in an arcade game, it's sort of similar to, to editing a scene in a film. It has a tempo. It has a rhythm. You hit, you hit these beats. And, and if you think about uh, designing levels in arcade games as having a tempo, incorporating music into that makes sense. The other thing is that Jeff has a lot of friends who are musicians. So people like Gribbles and Corrupter, who are who are giving Jeff music because they love him, they also know Jeff's sensibilities. So there's something, this there's, there's is a perfect storm of Jeff getting music from fans and putting them into, so who are designing, who are creating music to fit into a Jeff game. And then Jeff, who has a musical sensibility, taking this music and making it work even better. Uh, I mean, the, the soundtrack, Gribble said the soundtrack for um, Moose Life. It's one of my favorite video game soundtracks. It's just great. And it fits the game perfectly. It's, uh, yeah. There's something about it. And you think of something I mean, like Tempest 2000, and obviously, I mean, they actually released the soundtrack to that on CD, didn't they? Because it was such, you know, so yeah. epic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I, it's, it's hard to say. There's something, there was... The, the Tempest 2000 soundtrack is so iconic. There's something about Tempest 2000 itself. It's it's, it's like a, it's a snapshot from, it was like 1996, or wasn't it? Or something, right about then. It's, it's the, yeah. the mid to late 90s, it's a snapshot of culture then. It has like that kind of rave vibe to it. It's like a, that Gareth Noyce described, it's like it's like a one of those rave flyers you get used to get. <laughs> it's, it's, it's colorful, it's bright, it's brash, um, it's stylized, sort of futuristic, but but familiar at the same time. Warm, and there is something about it when, when you're playing it it's like um you know you almost go into like a trance because of you know the, the music's pumping away and you've got those like exploding neon visuals everywhere it is a, it's an incredible experience well that's, that's the thing about a lot of jeff's games if not all of them a lot of jeff's games require you to get into that was it uh shaheed called a, an alpha state you got to get you know you got to get into the zone and let jeff's visuals and music wash over you so that you're and you're the eye of the storm when you're when you're thinking about what you're doing while you're playing a Jeff game, you're always going to lose. You have to kind of get in sync with it. Um, there's Jeff's uh, Grid Runner for uh, Minor to Arcade Volume One. That game is brutal. Nine times out of ten, I have a bad day playing it. But there's those moments when like you just get in sync with the game and you're not really thinking about it, and it and it becomes sort of like almost like line dancing. You're in sync with it and you're hitting the beats and it's it's great. I go really far. But sometimes Jeff's games are just confounding. <laughs> so, so is that kind of how LamaSoft works? Then it will be mainly Jeff and Giles, and then other stuff kind of comes under the umbrella, and you know, musicians, and uh, and then um, that creates the team. It's Jeff and Giles, and then I mean, Jeff used to go on uh, for his eight bit games. Jeff would go on to CompuNet. Um, I'm I'm assuming you remember CompuNet. Yeah, um, and oh, yeah. then and just sort of like put the word out. I'm looking for some sprites for a, for an arcade game. Um, anybody want to donate something? That'd be great. And that's sort of the the way the music works. He doesn't want to go to that well too often. He doesn't want to take advantage of people. That's why there was no music in uh, Minotaur Arcade Volume One. He and it didn't need it. But he uh, he he understands people like to give him stuff, and he doesn't want to take advantage of that. He doesn't 
I mean, so I mean, people sort of get paid for the uh, like like Tempest Two Thousand soundtrack was released in CD. You can get the soundtracks to Jeff's more recent games on uh, Bandcamp. Um, I think it's called like the Lamasoft Musicians M Double O, and you can get uh, Polybius soundtrack on there, and the Gribble soundtracks up there too. Uh, Tempest Four K is up there, I think, or TXK. Sorry. It's funny that you mentioned actually that he was kind of you know modest or a bit shy about asking too much because you know the amount of musicians who, who work on video games that will give their right arm to be featured in a Jeff Minter game is probably endless <laughs> line of them. Yeah, I don't think Jeff would believe that though. Jeff's a pretty humble mm. guy. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's 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 a humble guy, but he knows he's excellent, but doesn't want to doesn't want to go on about it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I'm quite interested in kind of behind the scenes at, you know, Llama Soft and Jeff's farm when you went there. What was kind of the environment like then? I mean, did it seem like a, a busy place? Was it, you know, a lot of work going on? What was it kind of like when you were there? It's so uh, if you've ever seen a development office or been to one, it's not that. It's the opposite of that. It's, he has a it's, a, it's a small freehold in a remote part of Wales. And um, he has a his set up in a barn. I mean, it's just a refurnished barn. It's like it's, it's got couches and a TV, but it's it's referred to as the barn. And you know, bedrooms upstairs, kitchens next door. Um, it's it's that he, he lives there. It's everything is an extension of him. You know, it's 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 not. It doesn't feel like an office. I mean, I I was a freelancer when I was doing graphics back in the eighties, and it was it's basically the same setup you get up you have a cup of coffee you walk to the, the workroom and you start doing work I and mean, that's basically jeff's life and then like when he's done he'll uh check his email or go th- walk three feet from his computer and watch some tv everything's right at his fingertips but it's not an office there's no receptionist there's no sign over the door there's no cubicles it's it's a partially finished barn with some comfy couches and a lot of plushies I mean, it's very, very low key, very casual, and there's a really nice cadence to to Jeff's life. I was, I was only, I've only been there twice, and so I maybe spent a total of five days in his company on the farm. But the rhythm of the day is he gets up early, feeds the sheep, comes back, has his morning coffee or morning tea, gets a bit of work done, goes out, sees the sheep at lunchtime. I mean, it's it's just a really nice day, and then once or twice a week you go get a curry. Um. It's just nice. <laughs> I gotta say, I was, I was quite jealous of it. It was, it was a really nice environment. Definitely not like those kind of crunch environments when you're in a development team with you know 200 people or something like that, and lots of pressure. Right. Well, I mean, it's uh, not to say he doesn't take his deadline seriously, but it's definitely not a. It's not. I mean, I've seen. I've been to offices where there's no windows, and it's just a, a you know, um, a bullpen where like there's 20 people all working in the same room. Um, this is not, it's definitely not that. And that wouldn't be an environment Jeff would thrive in. I mean, he was in a cubicle when he worked at Atari. I mean, he did all right, but it, it wasn't his first choice. <laughs> and when, and when Atari basically closed their doors, he, he moved on. Well, some, some people I've known have destri- uh, described Jeff's games a bit like a kind of drug trip. I, I wouldn't know, of course, but, um, <laughs> kind of lo- looking at the designs, you know, you get stuff like in the corner of your vision and and like approaching from the side of the screen and, and places that you usually wouldn't expect it. And that creates a really stimulating experience. Do you think it takes a, a certain approach to design to, to create that style? A lot of it is, um, well, I mean, to answer your question directly, yes. <laughs> I mean, he's, he, uh, he creates uh, procedural games, sort of. I mean, he's, it's, it's, it's scripted to a degree there is there are points take for example grid runner and a, a minotaur arcade volume one grid runner there's so you've got a grid and like the bad guys for each level are specific uh, but how they and what their activities do on the the grid are specific but how they actually move once they're triggered is always random to a degree like so there's a behavior but it's not it's not like if you're when i used to play a uh, nemesis at the office uh, system three like it's it's once you know the pattern you can beat it jeff's games have a rhythm but it's not a pattern so like you know the, these guys are going to come into the grid at a certain time i know when they're going to come in but i don't know where they're going to come in and and that's the thing and jeff's games are like that where like you know what to expect more or less but it always comes from a place where you're not expecting it like polybius is like that uh, polybius is some of the levels are really intense. There's, there's a bit in the later levels where, like, this lightning will come down from 
out of nowhere, basically. But it sort of tells you on on the grid that you're flying on, it tells you where it's going to land, and you have like this a split second to react. Um, so there's so Jeff doesn't cheat you. He doesn't he doesn't um, hit you without giving you some kind of warning. And it's, it gives you these cues. It, it could be an audio cue, it could be a visual cue, and it's your job as a player to pick up on those cues to learn the cues fast enough to survive. Um, and some people don't like that, right? which is fair enough. Um, it's, it's but the people who like, do like it love it. Uh, this is an intensity to Jeff's game design that expects you to keep up. They expects you to, to do the work to learn how he doesn't like. He uh, in the interviews that I did with him, he, he does say people just complain because isn't a tutorial that explains everything in the game to them, and and that's not what Jeff's about. Like he wants you to just part of playing a Jeff game is the the element of discovery. He's not going to hold your hand. But he's going to give you enough clues and enough information to learn on your own. I mean, playing, I mean, Space Giraffe is sort of is an excellent example of that. It's got such a gentle learning curve, and yet it goes so far. I mean, or uh, Moose Life is another one. It has a really gentle learn, uh, learning curve. The first twenty levels are sort of arguably really easy, and then it just all all the things. So he's he's taught you like these twelve different things over, over the first twenty levels, and then level 21 22 they're all on the screen at the same time so <laughs> he's giving you enough information to deal with it now it just raises the stakes so like looking at jeff's games they look a bit like kind of contemporary art or even a demo scene demo you know yeah um, where does he get a lot of his influence from uh demos and artwork he and giles both have a, a taste for the, for the demo scene i mean he's uh he's been guest uh at, at a few demo scenes um over the years it's more specifically to do with the, the look of his games is more specific to do with his light synth work and jeff has been uh, developing light synth technology as he calls it um since uh since the 80s since he did a, a demo a, a 1k demo that you could type in it was like a magazine listing and you could type it in and then he turned that into something called psychedelia which you could buy and basically he has always been fascinated with the idea of like lights moving on a screen in time to music long before visualizers were a thing. He had one on the Vic 20 and this Commodore 64. You moved it with a joystick and it wasn't in sync with any music. You had to move the lights yourself, but there was a very small audience for that. But it's something that he was being very, very passionate about for since the beginning of his career. Um, so long, I mean, the film is about this. It's called Heart of Neon because Jeff developed this light sound technology to the point where it appeared on the Xbox 360 and it was called Neon on on that. It's, it's a, it was a light, a light synthesizer that you could play like an, an instrument. If you plugged in four controllers on the Xbox 360, four people could manipulate the video in time to the music together and play it like a band, mm. which sounds a little esoteric and weird until you try it. And then you go, oh yeah, this is great. It is absolutely fantastic. The thing is that most people don't know you can do that unless you've read Jeff's blog on his website and seen the instructions. You wouldn't know that because Microsoft didn't really care. It wasn't something they were interested in supporting. And then on later versions of the Xbox, that functionality just disappeared because Jeff wasn't involved anymore. But Jeff, so Jeff always had an issue with trying to get people to buy this light synth technology because you don't know you want it until you've tried it. But you know, why would you try it if you don't know you want it sort of thing? So he, to be able to, to to leverage this technology, he's put it at the heart of every game he's done since 2005. Uh, Space Giraffe, uh, Grid Runner Revolutions, all his VR stuff for uh, Minotaur Arcade, Moose Life, all that stuff is driven by uh, this engine called Neon. And it's it's a very specific aesthetic that, that ties in with Jeff's vision of moving light in time to music in a, in a tempo that stimulates the audience so like at the back uh, tempest uh, 4000 it's basically sitting inside his neon engine all that psychedelic stuff that streams past you as you're playing on the grid that's jeff and that's that's his aesthetic so to say he was inspired by laser light shows back in the day you know I go to like the the planetarium and see like the pink floyd laser show stuff like that so, sort of thing that he uh, grew up liking as a kid and that, that sort of percolated in his brain as, as he's gotten older and, you know, he, he, he likes to sort of evoke a trippy sort of experience for people who, who, who wouldn't do that normally. It's, it's, a, it's a safe trip, he describes it being. You can, you can unplug, you can put a joystick down, you can unplug your TV if it's too intense. But if you like it, 
you can go all the way. Space Giraffe is the most intense psychedelic experience I've ever seen in a video game. And it's a fantastic game to boot. And even that, you know, kind of music and visuals mix. I remember, you know, originally, I guess a prototype for that would have been on the Atari Jaguar CD when you put a CD in and you got that virtual light machine on there, you know, back in the mid 90s. Oh, yeah, that was that was. uh, So Jeff had was this is going to be in the film, too, but he was developing um, a hardware version to sell to uh, to musicians and live performers. He had a. He created a company called the Virtual Light Company with this, these two other developers, um, two hardware developers, and they, he had this this hardware ready to go. Prince used it in a in a video, uh, and then and some a very limited tour that he did in the in the UK. Uh, the Shaman used it at T in the Park, um, but uh, the money wasn't in place when it came to manufacturing time, and it's just it just fell through, which is a shame. So that technology, which was ready to go. They managed to leverage into the uh, the Jaguar CD, so it managed to survive. And a lot of Jeff's stuff, like Jeff will, Jeff will do this cutting edge software or hardware technology, and then sometimes it doesn't work out. His work will live on in another project later. He he doesn't throw any ideas away. He always manages to get it out there somehow, which is Jeff's genius and his commitment to his his craft. That was a rambling answer to your question. I hope yeah, I no, no, it, was interesting. It, it, it fits into our next one because, like, just. After so many years of development and kind of growing industry technology, you can still look at a, a Jeff Minter game and go, that's a Jeff Minter game in like right. a few seconds. And even though the technology's changed, he's not added ultra realistic graphics. He's he's no. still kept the elements and the foundations of it. And uh, it's that kind of type of design that, that you were talking about that's really helped that. Well, somebody, uh, it was uh, Jim McCauley was saying that uh, Jeff, Jeff is, would acknowledge himself. He's not an artist. He does what what you call programmer art. So, like when uh, when he when he has to draw something, it's it's uh, iconic rather than representational. It's not. He's not an artist, but he can do procedural stuff really well. So you know, um, so these psychedelic patterns just lean into his skill set. Uh, I mean, the the, the moose. I'm not even entirely sure that the moose in Moose Life even looks like a moose. It looks more like a deer to me, but. It doesn't matter because it's about the game. It's not about you know, and the giraffe and space giraffe. It doesn't look like a giraffe, but it doesn't. That doesn't matter. It's a Jeff game, and it's there's something uh, frenetic and and exciting about it. And uh, I mean, ultimately, Jeff wants people to come away from his games um, feeling elevated and positive. And, and there's something about that ambition that that goes a long way. You know, if, after all these years and after all like the the bumps and knocks he's taken on a, on a career in uh, one of the one of the hardest businesses to be in. I would have said um, uh, he's still positive and he still wants his audience to feel good. That that's that's a, a mark of a winner for me. Well, one game you've already mentioned, and you know, to me is like a, a typical classic Jeff Minter game done with modern technology is Polybius. Um, yeah, and you know, playing that game, that pumping soundtrack, and again, we've talked about that kind of you know that Zen-like state that you get into when playing that game, especially yeah. in virtual reality, and the fact that that was based on. You know, the legend of this um, mythical arcade machine that supposedly hypnotized kids back in the early 80s. I mean, what, what did you kind of learn about Polybius then while making the documentary? It's, it's my favorite anecdote in terms of there's, there's a couple of games where, where Jeff and Giles talk about the development of a game that, that really sort of capture for me what I wanted to try to do with the film. Uh, one game was like uh, Five a Day that was part of uh, Jeff's um, it was called the I think it was called the Minotaur Project. It's basically these iOS, the, the mobile gaming uh, project he did. Their, their anecdote about that is is, is fantastic. Um, and then the the story of how they made Polybius is just great. There's the, they had these ideas. Jeff uh, doesn't write down a game design before he starts. He has like this 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 programming technique that he likes, and he wants to develop that into, the, into a gaming idea. So he and at that time Sony was basically supporting his development. They'd give him a little bit of money to help him finish a game, and then they'd release it on the PlayStation. So he went there um, with basically just some pictures and some video clips. Like, I want this to kind of feel like Tron and sort of like have a vibe of like 2001 Stargate sequence, and it's going to have this technology, and you're going to fly a ship that looks a bit like this, and it's going to have gates and stuff. Um, actually, it didn't have gates at that point. The gates came up during, like, he had, he had to go to London to present to Sony, you know, this is what the game's going to be. It had like, what, three months or something. And uh, sort of a last minute, he had these horns and he, he wanted to do that as a gate. And then when he went to the gate, you go a bit faster. 
So it, it, that's that was the hook. And then and he said, well, this is sort of okay. And then Jala said, well, why don't you put a sound, you put the sound effect in? Put make it make a noise. So when you go through the gate, there's this ping noise, and that's and it, as you go through each successive gate, the ping gets at higher pitch, and you go a bit faster. And then they realized as they were playing it, this is excellent. This is it. This is the bit. So they sent the demo to Sony, and they got the, the note back saying like this. This the, apparently the tester had just played it all day. They said this is fantastic. <laughs> a, a game hasn't been this much fun on first sight ever it blew this guy's mind so it's so it's a talk so it it's, it's an interesting anecdote about and there's a, there's more to it too and there's some footage that jeff had filmed on his camera of giles trying stuff out so it's this it's sort of like jeff's process is really sort of uh organic you know to say he doesn't plan it out he doesn't have a design document where like you know on page 12 he tells you what's going to be in you know level six he he feels his way and his method is always about he'll just play it himself for hours and and when it feels right to him it's ready to go i agree with how incredible that game is that's the only game i set my psvr up for literally the only game i play on. <laughs> i bought that's why i bought a ps4 is yeah. to play that game uh, it's the game it's the one jeff game that i've actually got closest to finishing i've actually made it to the last level i haven't and there was something about like i don't want to finish it so i've played <laughs> about halfway through the last level which is really long um and i was like you know what maybe i don't need to finish it there's something about I don't want to feel like it's behind me because yeah. there's something about that experience is, is so much fun. It's so much fun. And it's these levels that are so cruel. Like the recurses one where like if you get hit by the wrong pill, you're sent back to the beginning of the level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh. Brutal. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do you think like the industry is kind of – it was it was a bit stuck in the same mold and the same genres and then VR came around and Jeff kind of saw that as a way to – like reinvent and remix himself in that in that VR world. Well, right. So um, I mentioned that I was talking about doing a an id software um, film at one point, and the, the thing about id software, they, they talk about the uh, oh the the holographic room in, in Star Trek: Next Generation, like the, the holodeck, and that how that was sort of like the standard that these guys were were, were aiming for. They wanted to have this kind of virtual reality experience. Um, I don't think the holodeck is where Jeff's at. He's not looking for realism. He's looking for Tron. He wants to live in Tron. And every VR game that Jeff makes gets closer and closer to that. Something about the way Jeff approaches VR is not like uh, really anybody else right now, which is entirely Jeff. That's always been Jeff's thing. He always comes at it from, from this oblique angle and does something unexpected with it that's, uh, the, that at the same time totally uses the te technology in the best way. Um, I mean, Jeff's doing a new light synth using uh, the Oculus Quest hardware. That's so specifically designed for that. Um, I don't know what that means, but I know when I pick it up, it's going to feel just right for those controllers and that headgear. I just, so it's sort of, I, thought, I mean, Jeff is about learning the hardware. Jeff is about learning the hardware in a way that makes sense to him. And once he, he understands it, he proves he's connected with it by making the perfect game for it. Uh, that seems to be, I mean, you know, his, his Jaguar, the reason why Jeff's game on the Jaguar was the most successful Jaguar game, that and Alien vs. Predator, was because it was written so perfectly for the hardware. No, no, totally agree as well, yeah. The fact that a lot of people, yeah, with the Jaguar in particular, they'd be lazy and just use the 68K, not use a full hardware, but guys like Jeff actually saw the potential there and thought, right, let's use everything that's in it. He's always pushing himself. Like they, uh, he and Giles were always bragging about how on the uh, PlayStation Four they were the first one to do a game that was 120 frames per second mm. uh, in each eye and in, in VR. 120 frames per second in VR. Oh yeah, they, they were patting themselves on the back the whole time they were talking about it. <laughs> Rightly so as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I loved is um, you know I'm a big fan of Black Mirror and their Bandersnatch was an incredible episode, that interactive episode that dropped right. a couple of years ago. And obviously Jeff Minter has a, a bit of a cameo in there where he plays um, a an author called uh, Jerome F. Davis, who was a you know a game programmer who descended into madness. Did he talk right. much about his involvement with Black Mirror? And is it kind of covered? Well, that was that sort of happened while like during during production. So between me visiting Jeff on the farm the first time and the second time, this all happened. That and uh, Jeff's Polybius appearing in a Trent Reznor video. So just for for a brief second, I thought, oh, Jeff's blown up huge, and then it all subsided again. So Jeff's really coy about that stuff. He didn't. He wouldn't. He wouldn't tell me what it was. It was ended up. Ended up. Gary Lydon told me what happened. 
because I guess Jeff takes his non-disclosure agreements very seriously. Mm. Uh, but yeah, no, it was uh, Charlie. Charlie Brooker's a fan, and uh, he approached Jeff, and Jeff, being being the down ass guy that he is, said, "Sure, let's let's do it." I haven't seen all of it. It's that's another it's like a movie as a game. So there's bits of Jeff's thing that I haven't seen yet. But yeah, it was it was interesting that they cast Jeff, and Jeff had a good time on a great time on, on set, and he had a, basically another memory and a, and a long career of memories. Uh, so yeah, he didn't say much because Jeff doesn't say much. He, Jeff is most uh, articulate when he's talking about his games. Mm. Really, when he's talking about gaming, he's the most relaxed. He is the most eloquent. Doesn't really have much to say about anything else, <laughs> which is which is totally fine. Well, well do you think he's ever going to retire from development or just? Keep going, keep keep inventing stuff. Well, I mean, he doesn't even have to go to the office, so why why would he? I mean, he's if you true, and the, and the trick is like you know, it's not he doesn't see it as a job. I mean, programming is an extension of him, so it's sort of like breathing. He's not going to stop developing until he stops breathing, I guess. I mean, for one pretty harsh way of putting it, but he's uh, why why would he stop? He's very very he's at, he's at his happiest when he's coding. He loves playing with new technology. I think if there's anybody more excited about what technology could do tomorrow, it's Jeff. And he's going to find some way of putting a light synthesizer on it. Well, what kind of stuff can you see in like kind of the, the backstage footage? And have you captured any kind of uh, extra moments we should look out for? I mean, it's all behind the scenes, isn't it? I mean, what, what, what is in front of the scenes for a game developer is, is the game, right? So everything, about, everything that you see of Jeff. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, my favorite time was like following Jeff at the, uh, at the Play Expos, to be honest. I mean, I love visiting the farm. But Jeff's in his element when he's showing off his games to an audience that really wants to see him, and and that was you know the the uh, the three days I spent in Blackpool with Jeff and Giles was fantastic, and the people walking up. We had like a little competition. He was he was previewing Minotaur Arcade Volume One, and he had a competition on both days. Like the highest score, uh, highest score would get a, a some kind of game controller. I forget what it was. And this, this, it was like the first day it was like this ten year old kid got the highest score on, on goat up and he was so happy and jeff autographs it and the mother was like just beaming it was just a nice day giles being excited about like the the, the release spectrum and the next table over it was just great that's that's uh there's a moment uh one of my favorite shots was uh he'd just come back from the the podcast he recorded with you and yep. he's got that card and i and i'm i'm pretty confident he doesn't know i was watching him He's he's just he's just reading the card and he's got this look on his face. It's just so nice. He's uh, those private moments where he, he's he's unguarded and he doesn't think anybody's watching him. Oh, fantastic! Well, I think you know after listening to this chat that we've had with you, Paul, everyone needs to check out Heart of Neon. Where can people watch it then? Uh, well, right now it's it's still in development. Uh, truth be told, uh, there is a Patreon page uh, where for a humble donation you can. Uh, see the, the work in progress every month uh, i show you like a what i'll be working on that month there's a commentary video that goes with it and uh, a video diary for for everybody that sort of talks about the process the because like i want the film to be about demystifying the video game development process in a way that films haven't been doing it and the, so the patreon page is demystifying the filmmaking process it's, it's me sharing everything that i've done uh, the Patreon page has been up for a year so like there's Hours and hours and hours and hours of video of different takes and and uh, there's there's also like a um, things that aren't going to be in the film section. So I, I, every month I upload like a longer extended takes or bits that just aren't going to be in the film because, like I said, forty years is a lot of story to cover and just, I just can't get to everything. So while I don't know when the actual release date is going to happen, there is an opportunity to to take a look at what what the film is, where it's come from, and where it's going every month, um, and hopefully. People, people, people have been subscribing to it, so people, somebody's enjoying it. Uh, I enjoy the process; it keeps me honest. I'm always uh, there's always something new for me every few weeks, so um, it's good for me, and uh, people seem to be enjoying it. Brilliant. Well, we'll put a link to that in our show notes, so um, everyone can go and check out the, the work in progress. Paul, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. Mm-hmm.